And then she made this statement. She said, the quality of our lives, actual, the quotient of happiness is going to be more determined by the quality of our friendships and the small relationships, so to speak, than it is the size of whatever stage you're standing on. Yeah. I, I mean, it's. I do think that the the bigger and the wider that you're thinking, um, you know, those inter, those small relationships are the ones that end up suffering. Fame <laughs> is making yourself accessible to those that you really don't care about at the expense of those you do. Today's podcast is a little different than those that we've done before in that we're going to discuss a secular book, uh, From Strength to Strength by Arthur C. Brooks. I was at a dinner with J.D. Greer, and he's the pastor of uh, Summit Church, and he and his wife, Veronica, read this book recently, and they said, Ben, you really need to read this book. So we grabbed a copy of you, and I read it together, and it is such a thoughtful read on aging, on what it means to redefine or think about the second half of your life. Uh, personally, I think it challenges us from as Christians to think through a, a Christian worldview of what does it mean for me to finish well, to use the gifts God's given me. And so I have thought that this would be such a meaningful conversation for pastors and ministry leaders too, of like, what does the next half of my life look like? Yeah. And just the emotions that that brings. When change happens, how do you handle it emotionally? All of us have moments when we realize we're getting older. I think when our daughter left the house this year, it was a massive shift in my thinking about the passage of time, my own mortality. Uh, so if you're out there and you're listening and you're thinking, you know, where am I going with the rest of my life? And how do I learn from the past and make the most of the future? Like this episode's for you. So listen in to this conversation and just the fun hearted moments we have with the careers. JD, you were with me at a camp recently and a couple months ago, and you said, I have a book you need to read. And, you know, us pastor type people, we get these recommendations all the time. So I was like, yeah, okay, JD. So I went and Googled it and I saw that the subtitle, uh, the title of the book is From Strength to Strength, but the subtitle is Finding Success, Happiness, and Deep Purpose in the Second Half of Your Life. I was like, ooh, I'm 46. I maybe should read that one. And as I started to read the book, I was told Lindley, I was like, you've got to read this book. But I'm only 42, so I said, give me four years. I'll (laughs) I'll check that one out later. And so I was like, J.D., has Veronica read the book? And Veronica, you too have read the book, right? Yes. So we wanted to have you guys on. We've not done an episode like this of The Glass House where we just kind of unpack a, a thoughtful book. And so the book is Arthur Brooks, Arthur C. Brooks, From Strength to Strength. And it's really about how all the things that help us be, quote, successful in the first half of our life begin to work against us in the backpack part of our life. And the thing that that really (laughs) intrigued me was, I don't know if this startled you or not, but he has a lot of research on his side to suggest that between 38 and 53, you hit your intellectual peak, which felt really early to me. (laughs) And then- From that point on, you're basically living off what you've learned and relying on other people to help inform your life and ministry. And so here's the first question we want to start. It was just, why did this book impact you so much and and your marriage and your ministry? What discussions did it spark? Um, I'll go first since I recommended the book. First of all, two things I want to clarify. Number one is it's not just pastor to pastor recommending. I'm talking to the president of one of the largest publishing companies in the world. (laughs) Thank you. And so, yes, it takes, you know, I was like, I don't, is it okay to recommend a book to a guy like you that? You should. But, Always. Um, and then the second thing is, I definitely didn't think you were in the second half of life because you kind of have that always 27 look. To you. <laughs> I did start shaving last week, though. One day. Um, but, yeah, so I, I, um, that first chapter, I told Veronica afterwards, I was like, I it, I felt unnerved, like, like, I, I know we all have the experience where an author kind of understands us, but I felt like he is describing my secret fears right now Yes, and describing how I'm thinking and what I'm saying. He, he tells this story about this guy who, you know, obviously he's overhearing on a plane who obviously was a very accomplished person in his life, but just struggling with the fact that he's no longer the the headliner at something, he's, his wisdom is not always sought out on certain things, and 
and is just struggling with these feelings of, you know, how do I, how do I maintain, how do I, you know, fulfill this purpose having gotten through this? And so I, I got her started, you know, starting to read it immediately. And it, it was a lot of good conversation about, about what is God ordained in our life and how we are supposed to adapt to it. You know, sometimes she and I will, will um, talk, joke, lament about people that are trying to fight against the inevitable um, yeah. process of aging physically. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's certain things, but there's certain things like, okay, that's, you've gone a little too far there. Um, but, but <laughs> when I it's temptation, like yeah, you feel it. Yeah. Oh, and I know yes. men and women both do that, but let's just say that, that certain women, you know, let's say that they're, they're, they're prone to that. I, I think especially for guys like me and you, we're tempted to do it in the terms of career. I, I don't want to embrace the aging process. Right. And I fight against that. And that's what this book really kind of explains. Well, and let me stop you right there and invite the women in the conversation. Because I was asking Lindley on the way here, like, how does this hit you? Yeah. And you were thinking about it even from your role as a mom. You know, Ava just went to college. I've got three in high school who are soon leaving. And I said, you know, it's different for me because the second half of my life, it's, it's pretty early, honestly, to be kind of an empty nester. Um, but I've given, at that point, 21, 22 years of my life to parenting. I mean, and being a stay-at-home mom and giving them everything that I could give them. I mean, with with bouts of, of course, being a kids ministry director and pastor's wife and stuff. But it's scary also. Like, what does that look like? Because I'll be 45, 46 years old when Jack graduates, and that still feels like a lot of life yet and so left. Yeah. And so, like, where does the strength, where does it shift for me? Like, shifting from the strength of being a mom, some, yeah. most days, some days, you know, to <laughs> to another another role and what does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely identify with that. I'm, I just, just turned 45 and my oldest is now a second sophomore in college. And so, you know, it's like I'm barreling down this train track of a pretty massive shift, Mm -hmm. you know, like a career change kind of in many ways. And so it means that, yeah, it does have a certain, uh, certain impact in a different area for us. I'm curious to know how you're processing all that because I've had several conversations with women lately who are like, this is tricky. I mean, it's tricky to navigate. Like what, what, what is next? Like you said, a career path. Yes. I, uh, wow. We, we should do another podcast on that. (laughs) That is, uh, depends on the day it, you know, my second one is a senior in high school and then I have two more at home and, um, it's in some ways, uh, like better than I expected in some ways, like my oldest being a real adult doing her own thing now has been a really great thing for her and our relationship, all three of us. But the uh, profound loss that I feel, I don't, I don't think I expected it. Yeah. JD, when we were together that night, you were warning me about just the grief (laughs) process. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm telling you, when we dropped our daughter off to college, (laughs) Total meltdown yeah. all the yeah. way home. I mean, I could, um, she comes home tomorrow for, from college, and I'm like kind of crying. Like, I can't but it, wait. it has so radically changed the atmosphere of our home, and yes. we're still adjusting to it. But we're, yeah. we're talking about the same thing, these major life transitions and how it's kind of like what you said, J.D. It's like we just want to live in nostalgia and keep going mm-hmm. back to what was instead of grappling with the fact that the future is here. and We've got to deal with it. So let's jump into a discussion about what he describes as the striver's curse. I've never so heard I've never heard that term before, but I think it describes type A people who want to do mm-hmm. something great with their life in their 20s maybe. They've got these big dreams. And then there's this moment where you look on the list of all the things you were hoping to accomplish and there's terror of, "Oh my goodness, I've I've been able to do a lot of these things or I've achieved a lot of these things." How have you guys dealt with that like you you've been at Summit now I believe 20 years? JD, you've been the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. You've written books and you two together have done so many things. Like, how does it shift the way you start to think about the scorecard? Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. No. I think it's also um, part of the inherent in the striver's curse is that you're ambitious and driven and focused and like you get a plan, you make a plan, you work the plan, you stick to the plan. You know, yeah. like that's kind of the personality type. And for JD, I'm assuming for you as well, it would appear that um, that generally you are effective in that. And so for those of us in the universe that may not feel as effective all the time, that's I'm saying for me, mm-hmm. I don't feel as effective as he generally does. And so that's the curse of it to me. Like he actually feels fairly like things will, he can, he can 
He can make it work. He can and will I don't it. usually feel like that in my life. So I think that's part of the curse. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I'm trying to decide if I was going to say what I was going to say or respond to that. But let me let me start with what I was going to say, which is um, I, I want to be clear. I, I'm not done innovating, and I don't think that this book was a call to stop innovating. Yeah, it it is a recognition though that that the older you get, the more your life becomes about bequeathing certain things to a, a coming generation, which makes the Christian call to ministry yep. and the Christian call to discipleship, a particularly relevant thing for this. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not done innovating, but you only get to be young and scrappy and, um, you know, kind of, I got nothing to lose. You only get to do that one time. And by this point for, uh, you know, the kind of people Arthur Brooks is really focused on, you've gotten to a point where you've had some measure of success, you know, whether that's huge or small, but it's, it's some measure of success and you, 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 you've built something and you're wanting to steward that well. And then at some point, your church for a pastor, you know, the growth of that church may not be the primary thing yeah. that you should be using as your scorecard. I'm not saying it's nothing. It's just not the primary thing. You know, for me, it's it's shifted to, um, you know, in, in, in 50 years, I feel like the, the, the churches that Summit has planted, the leaders that we have raised up, and the leaders and planters that they have raised up, that'll be a much more important legacy than than the size of the congregation I have now or the quality of the sermons. Because even if they were great sermons, all the illustrations fifty years from now are going to be out of date. You know, yeah. so it's like you know this this focus of I can't remember the exact term he used, but he talked about going from this kind of this intelligence of innovation to one where you you're learning to synthesize and and, and turn it into wisdom, and that I think is the new scorecard for me. You know, it's wild. When I was reading this book, I, I wanted to go back and watch Cars 3. <laughs> Did you see Cars 3? Yeah. It's the yeah. one where Lightning McQueen realizes he's not fast anymore, yeah. but there's this young race car coming behind him, and he's got a lot, of te- lot to teach that young race car. It's like it was the Pixar version of From Strength to Strength. <laughs> yeah. And I love it. it. It made me think, too, JD, about the amount of intentionality I apply to coaching and mentoring. Because uh, it's always been something that I've done more accidentally than intentionally. Hmm. But it really challenged me to think about, okay, who, who's coming behind me that could use some time and some investment and some resources and some encouragement? You know, even at Lifeway, we, we hire young people all the time. They start out as like customer service agents, but they're like so vibrant and full of life and want to grow in their careers. What are we doing to help them take that next step? And it's easy. I, I think you're right. I think that if the square card in the church is often, how many people do we get at church on Sunday? And it's hard to shift out of that level of thinking. One of the questions we had prepared for you guys was related to workaholism. I don't know if you read his section on this. It was a little bit creepy, wasn't it? <laughs> Brooks, yeah. Brooks mentions that therapists generally diagnose workaholics on the following three questions. And just let me know, listeners, if any of these are convicting. Number one, do you spend your discretionary time working? Do you yes. usually think about work when you're not working? Yes. yes. <laughs> do you work well beyond what is required of you? Yes. yes. I do believe that ministry just by nature is such an around the clock thing. We, we've experienced something different in Lifeway. Uh, JD, believe it or not, like nobody calls me after five here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get a single email on Saturday or Sunday. I don't hear yeah. from anybody. So getting out of the, the rhythm of ministry has even helped us to see this more. Like it's so hard to not work yeah. all the time. Yeah. So how did you, how did you guys read that or how do you even react to that? I think it's like complicated because so what we do vocationally is also what we do that we're called to as believers. And so for a pastor, it's the same thing at some level their job is what all of us as believers are called to. So it's very tricky to figure out. I mean, so the kingdom is like my, the whole focus of my life. We all have a call and then now we do it as a job as well. And so it's sort of, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard someone talk about um, the difficulty for someone who, for example, has had an eating disorder, you know, an alcoholic, if they want to recover, they can not drink the rest of their life. That's a conceivable thing. And many do. 
but someone who has had a disordered relationship with food, they can't go the rest of their life and not eat. So Mm. they have to find a new way forward. So for pastors, again, your calling, your life's calling is also your job. So you can't just opt out of the calling Right. So I think it's super tricky to navigate the the difference for that, that especially if you're driven towards workaholism, personality wise, wiring wise, in which we just talked about this striver's curse for sure. JD is, I mean, he doesn't, you know, he just doesn't get tired. You know, that's just kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a fine line to find your way forward, walking by the spirit and figuring it out. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A second layer I would add to that is in what she alluded to there at the end, which is I, I do want to create a little bit of room for different personalities. Yeah. I've had to learn that kind of the hard way throughout my life that, that just because somebody else is wired one way, doesn't mean that I'm wired that way. And just because they need to rest this way, doesn't mean I need to rest this particular way. And, you know, there are certain people who really come alive in a hobby. Um, ben, I have tried, Veronica and I have talked for hours <laughs> on what would be a good hobby for me. You guys taking prayer requests? Yeah. You could, you and, could put that down. I've tried them all. I mean, you name it. I've spent <laughs> thousands of dollars trying to come up with He really hobbies. needs one. We're taking, in the comment section, <laughs> we're taking. Um, but you guys I, do it, not realize it, how long we've been talking about this very thing. We actually had, <laughs> last night, we had our Lifeway Christmas ELT party, and um, the chief legal officer used to play PGA golf. And he was like, I'm going to teach Ben how to play golf. And I was like, no, you're not. Like, he's not, he's not going to do it. He's going to say, I'm going to teach golf. Because Ben, like, he picks, like, he'll say to me, like, I'm going to start cooking. And right. he'll, he'll, Let's like. I'll buy all the stuff. He's I'll buy it all. Egg. I've got Jenny, them all. Jenny yeah. buys yeah. them all. He buys them all. Yeah. No, I, we don't even buy them. Because I'm like, no, you're not going to do that. Like, if you want a crock pot that I'll use later, that's fine. That's but, so funny. But anyway, anyway say what you yes, were going to so say. So we, like, we had this hoping? exact same problem. I was like, you need a hobby. So, yeah. So anyway, you know, exaggeration, obviously there, there, there are things we do for fun, but it is, she eventually said, I think work is kind of your hobby. (laughs) And so, um, so I I do want to acknowledge like, you know, reading and writing, that's all part of my job, but it's also something that I I really enjoy doing. And so I want to be careful on that. But having said that, I do think that within that, what within a healthy version are the seeds of unhealth. And that seeds of unhealth for me are when I have really wrapped up my identity in achieving a certain, whether it's, you know, um, how many people are knowing this, talking about this, you yeah. know, what kind of money's attached to it. And that God just has not called me to do that forever. Um, you know, it's even weird as a pastor talking in those terms now, but, but if you'll just be charitable, I, um, obviously none of us do this for money or recognition, but there's, a, there's just a sense in which I've got to say, um, God did not give me the same fervency in building at every stage of my life, and I've got to respond to that and not have my identity. One of the the, the hardest stories for me in that whole book, Ben, was um, the story of Charles Darwin. And I, listen, I know Charles Darwin's not every Christian's favorite scientist, and we have a lot that we disagree with him there. But just, I mean, historically speaking, he changed how scientists think. For better or for worse, he, he changed it. But he talked about how miserable the yeah. last three quarters of his life were. After he had, you know, again, we're not fans, but but after in achieving the world, in the yeah. science world, achieving what is arguably the largest scientific shift in history, you'd think at that point he'd kind of be like, I'm yeah. out, you know, right. and just enjoy the legacy. But instead, he was bitter and always like, why, why am I not the one writing the next article? that's coming out on, on, on the way this thing goes forward. And I thought that's, that's kind of me. He's yeah. like isolated and alone. And yeah, just, and I, mm-hmm. I don't want to be that one whose identity is always found in being, you know, the, 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 the next thing or the hot thing, right? I've never been that just for the record, but you know, in, in, in striving for that. So, well, he does do some work with neuroscience in here that I thought was interesting about how the brain, mm-hmm. it, we're just not wired to be able to enjoy fulfillment long. So we think if I just achieve this PhD, if I just get this diploma, if I just get my church to excise that I'm going to have this feeling of arrival. And he, he talks scientifically why that only lasts a very short time. And then yeah. you already shift into the mood of what's gap in my life that I need to fill. And I, I just see so much of my own journey in that. I mean, yeah. at, at 46, I feel like my life has, a, there's been a lot of Ecclesiastes. Mm-hmm. Mm. chasing things under the sun and finding, you know, it's really not that great. (laughs) 
Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I thought it was going to make me feel a certain way. And the truth is, it's still me in my skin struggling with the same stuff I've struggled with. One of the things Veronica told me when, when the, um, the invitation was extended to run for president of the SBC, um, I would be attracted to more ambitious things. Um, she, her virtue is she's very content with what we have. And she said to me, she said, listen, if you're doing this to climb the next rung in whatever stupid imaginary ladder you have in your head, <laughs> um, this is not going to bring our family anything but misery. And it's, it's going to be hard and it's going to complicate and lessen our joy in life, not increase it. Now, she said, now, if you're called to it and there are kingdom mission reasons why you should do it, then that's a sacrifice worth taking. But if, if it's just for the sake of I'll be happier when I've done this, she said, that's a, that's a fool's errand. Yeah. And then she made this statement. She said, the quality of our lives, actual, the quotient of happiness is going to be more determined by the quality of our friendships and the small relationships, so to speak, than it is the size of whatever stage you're standing on. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I do think that the, the bigger and the wider that you're thinking, um, you know, those inter, those small relationships are the ones that end up suffering. And then that's what this book kind of talks about that. Um, who was the composer he talked about? Um, Beethoven. Yeah. Beethoven that, you mm-hmm. know, found all that joy through kind of his um, son. I just think that's actually like biblical. I think that's what you see in Jesus's life. And he laid that pattern down even in his, like at 30, he laid that down. And so I just think that usually those, Bigger, grander, better things can quite often Given cost you line, what matters. Given that line that I always quote that you gave to me about fame, this is great. Oh, fame uh, is. Gosh, um, I'll repeat you it. Said it for years. She says, "Fame is making yourself accessible to a bunch of people you don't really care about at the expense of those that you do." Ooh, that is really good. Say, say it again. Yeah, say, yeah, it again. say it one time. <laughs> I feel stupid. I, didn't, I really did say it, so I'll take the credit. But right. <laughs> fame is making yourself accessible to those that you really don't care about at the expense of those you do. Wow. Mm. That's really good. You should tweet that today. <laughs> that is really good. And I, I mean, just full transparency, don't you see how quickly we get sucked up into that? Like, because I think... <laughs> I'm a Travis Tritt guy, you know, I'm going to be somebody someday. I listen to that song Great at least song. three times a week. And <laughs> I just admitted that on national. Have you tried guitar yet? On the side note, have you tried guitar? Oh, it's a great you? hobby. Yeah, it sounds great. He, he used I to have, play guitar. I have a guitar. Uh, I he, bought one. He proposed to me by writing a song. Oh my word, and, that's amazing. On his guitar. And I'm like, could you still play that? And he's like, no, yeah. I don't. I, don't I even needed that instrument to look romantic to get her. And that's that done. Moment. That's well, that. Yes. Well played. Yeah. Well played. But, but this idea that I think is almost American, um, very American, that we are told as kids, like self-actualize, get to the mm-hmm. highest place of success you can while you still have breath in your lungs because you only live once. But what they don't say is the cost of that. And by the way, you're going to have very few friends in life because you're going to leave them behind every time you see a better offer. Right. Or you're going to suffer chronic loneliness. And so I think the thing that I want to commend this book to, and by the way, it's not a Christian book. He does at one point admit that he's a believer, uh, but he quotes from all different writings. But I did find it interesting that he was making an attempt to recognize that there is some truth in all faith systems, which I think is, there, there's things you can grab that are biblical. And what he's really saying there is beware of what you want. So here, here's a question. Uh, so for pastors out there who maybe they're at Ministry Wives, they're at this place of like, I don't know what's next. Well, starting to feel the itch. Uh, we, have we run our course here at this church? How would you caution them or encourage them based on reading this book? Man, that's good. That's a great question, Ben. Because, you know, especially relevant now, because I've heard that, you know, there's all these studies that show that there's an unusually high amount of transition yeah. post COVID. And I was listening to Simon Sinek, who wasn't talking about pastors. He was just talking about executives in other fields. And he said, he said, what's happening is it's not burnout. It's lethargy that these um, guys are not used to men and women. Uh, these strivers are not used to. And they assume that the lack of upward, you know, kind of juggernaut type of, 
things, they assume that what that indicates is that God has moved on and so do they. That they're done. That they're done. He said, well, first of all, it's going to take a little bit of a while to re-engage in COVID. But second of all, and these are my words, not Simon Sinek's, uh, but second of all, um, you know, we've all gotten older. And we're also starting to deal with some of what Arthur Brooks is talking about in this book. Physiologically, as you mentioned, what's happening yep. as our, we're shifting from that liquid intelligence to that crystallized intelligence as our energy levels and our wisdom and all this, this kind of stuff that as it, as it shifts, we have to you realize that, it, yes, it, there may be a time where God calls one of us away from the church that we've been at for 20 or 30 years, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm done, it might mean that I need to re-engineer some of my own roles so that I am living in the max of how God has created me to be in this chapter. I think it's so wise. I, if I were that guy, I would go to my leadership and just be honest with them and say, I don't feel like God's calling me away, but I feel like I need to do it different. Yeah. And I could use some yeah. help um, sorting that out. But yeah. one thing I know is clear is I can't keep doing the same thing the same way. It's just I'm going to dry up right. and begin yeah. to explore. Like what are those new areas that, that do bring you life? If you're honest with yourself, I think one of the hardest things about being a pastor is admitting you don't like certain things. <laughs> like, you know how hard it is to say, I really don't like walking into a hospital. Don't like the way it makes me feel. Don't like standing there. Don't like any part of it. It's really hard to say that. Yeah. And it feels like what, if someone is in ministry and reads this book, they're going to step away and say, okay, which parts of this job really are life-giving to me that I could double down on right. and raise up well, some an, other people? An, an, another dimension on that, Ben, is also not just identifying that, but also which parts did give you life mm -hmm. that you're just not as effective at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we work out together. It's one of our hobbies. There we go. We, um, we go to CrossFit. And oh. one of the discouraging things to me at 49— Oh, thanks for bringing that up, by the way. Since I've been resisting that for years. Thanks okay, well, <laughs> yeah, like, this is the, the word of the Lord the to you right now. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Spirit it's, of prophecy. it's time to start working out together. <laughs> there you go. Um, we're not all blessed, though, with genes like Ben's. That, yeah. So anyway, but um, one of the discouraging things for me at 49 is that I work every bit as hard and I get less result. Yep. Mm. Um, it's not an effort thing. It's an, an age thing. And um, what I'm, you know, one of the things that Brooks use, talks about is he talks about um, – in your work life, you're running harder on the treadmill than you ever ran and getting and, and, and you're getting less out of it. And I think recognizing there are things that used to give me life that I will continue to do, but I need to change how I'm doing them and the priority emphasis I'm giving and the priority of them because just like my strength is, is diminishing, some of these other capacities, some of them are diminishing and some of them are shifting. And wow. I got I to gotta embrace that shift. That's really interesting. When we were first married, we met with a guy, and he said uh, something about your energy, of how like you just cannot maintain. He said, beware, there's going to come a moment in your life where your energy starts working against you. Yes. Interesting. So I thought this book, for me, um, I mean, I'm in a different place than Ben, of course, right now, just not, not working outside of the home, and um, I'm not striving a lot to like get laundry done and all those kind of things. So it hit different, but I, I did love the book and I it, it brought up great conversation between he and I. But the thing that I think it did do is just kind of a recognition of how our energies are changing, how they're so I feel like I'm less energetic than I was even, you know, I mean, we, we started storyline in our younger thirties and like, now we talk about planning a church and I'm like, that's a lot of work. Like, yeah. I don't think I have the energy to do that. Yeah. And yeah. so what it did for me is just to identify what what is what is one of my strengths that I can maintain. Because mm -hmm. I can't keep working like I did, you know, 10 years ago because I don't have that sort of energy. And so I think that was an interesting part of the book for me. Mm. Yeah. I kind of want to ask this question of the ladies because our, our listeners are a lot of pastor's wives who listen. But as, as you're in your 40s, what questions do you find yourself asking? a lot, like internally. Like you mentioned, what am I going to do when all the kids are gone? That's one. But just like, oh. what are some of those fearful questions you ask yourself as you think about reorienting your life? Oh, I mean, I ask, I don't, I mean, <laughs> I, we talk about this way more than you probably want to. Like, what is it? What I need a biblical theology of aging. <laughs> and I mean, like, wow. Like as I'm no longer parenting the way I did, right. That's mm -hmm. not quite true, but it's coming down this I mean, it's like a freight train coming at me. So, um, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean on like, 
you know, to, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, don't go quietly into that dark night. I don't want to go quietly, but also I don't want to just like give up. So like, what's the line between the two? I don't, Hmm. you know, things like that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, should we talk a lot about parenting that shift between where you're really controlling your kids in their younger years mm-hmm. and whereas there is this kind of like, look, I'm not setting you free. God is setting you free because he's making you age, my kid. And so you know that seems like a terrible idea to me, but here we are. And all <laughs> yeah. the ways we thought as a parent in those first thirteen years, I mean we're you have to re gear. And then yeah. after college, it's a totally different thing. But there's a similar thing when it comes to um We've already talked about our career. We've talked about how we look. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah, what that is that? Just because, you know, when, when you start to get in those mid-40s to mid-50s, that's when you just really do. You start to right. go from one version of you to a different version. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and and you start to, like, notice in pictures that your T-shirt's popping out. <laughs> it's really not cool at all. Yes. Which brings us back to couples workout sessions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should do them. <laughs> also, I think just... Um, you know, what I want to do with my Lord help us all, but now I'm the older woman, right? I'm, you know, we're, yeah. we we should put some thought towards that. And like, it doesn't. Well, wait, no, babe, you're not the younger. Uh, I, <laughs> no, I, I really am. Up right there. I'm like really 45. <laughs> it's real. So if I thought I wasn't, I definitely am now. So just like, okay, well, I have a calling now and it's, it's shifted over the last five ish, give or take years. I don't know exactly, but you know, so what does that mean? You know, those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the conversation of purpose happens a lot in our household now. Like, what is my purpose? What am I here for? What has God called me to do? Because I always say, I'm like, I don't feel like I, I don't, I have so much like inside of me that I want to be able to give. But does that mean like give it as in a volunteer role somewhere at a church? Right. You know, I just, I don't have specifics around it, but I'm kind of like, I just, I, there's a lot that just feels like it's ready to come out, but I don't know what right. it is. I think right. there's fear too about our relationship changing of yeah. like when the kids are gone, like what if it's terrifyingly boring? Yeah. <laughs> like I have a friend right you now. just talked about it this morning. Just talked about it this morning about when the last kid goes, like what does that look like? What does it mean? Like all that stuff. Well, I mean, I'll share this. Ben and I've had this conversation a lot in that I, I say to him all the time, like, out with the old and with the new. And I'm like, I think sometimes you're stuck with me because of the covenant, but not be- because you're bored with me sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's true sometimes. Okay. And, yeah. And so, yeah, well, I'm stuck with him too. Right. I was so, like, this works both ways. Yes. Oh, yeah. In our worst but, moments, and he's like, the only reason you're still yeah. here is the Bible says you can't leave. Yeah. Yes. Like, well, I'm like, I'm, you. no, I'm like, you could leave, except for that you'd be out of a job. And, um, and so like, that's going to be real tricky on you. That's marital security for you. So I, you know, but I do think like, it is scary. You know, what happens when they leave and, you know, uh, will he be bored with me kind of thing? Right. So we just this week, I was having a a conversation with a a high ranking guy here at Lifeway and his, his wife, their kids are gone. He said, last night something happened. I looked at her and said, what are we going to eat? What are we going to watch? And she said, has it come down to this? It's just that. <laughs> <laughs> this is our life. And it, it really is going back to Arthur Brooks. It's like in the back half of your marriage, you have to like throw out the script and like create a new way of doing marriage that doesn't rely on the rhythms of kids. And, and ministry. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I think we, that's the thing that's different too. Like, how do you change, like for pastors, how do you shift ministry to where you can't be at absolutely everything? How do you help mentor, get the younger guys do you feel like your dad gave us such a great picture? Yeah. Yeah. My, um, my dad was, a, he, he actually was never in ministry uh, vocationally, but he was a, he was a plant manager of a textile factory. But um, after he retired, um, he moved up here and he mentors. So he is busier than I am at the church, just meeting people. Mentoring no exaggeration. People. Uh, my mom went to be with the Lord this year. And, um, you know, he um, took the time to grieve and everything, but then he's kind of resumed. He's like, you know, however long God gives me, I want to pour it into this next generation. And there are so many young men and women at our church that, 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 that call him a spiritual father. And I've told her several times, like, I hope that whatever that stage is there, that I will embrace it as heartily as he has. And he was doing that. Like, okay. Even when, in Winston Salem before he retired, but he was in his like late fifties, et cetera he was still working with the youth and stuff like that, just putting time towards people. And so he was doing that. Yeah. My um, John Piper said something um, for people who are like, who is this Arthur Brooks? Uh, he's a great writer. You should, you should acquaint yourself with him. But um, John Piper, if that makes you feel better. Um, he, he talks about 
Um, it's a really helpful metaphor um, I heard him use of thinking of your life in chapters rather than as one long arc. Mm. And he said, because a lot of times you see, you know, if it's one long arc, you see yourself up and then beginning to decline and it's nothing but depressing. He said, but what if you just look at God ended this chapter? Now he's beginning a new chapter and this chapter has got its own climax points and its own struggles. And anyway, it was just, it was, it was a helpful metaphor to think about as you, you go through these. That's really helpful. That reminds me of the metaphor. I think Rick Warren said this once that we tend to think about our life as hills and valleys. Mm. We're either on top of the mountain or we're in a valley, but the truth is it's like a set of train tracks. There's always a track of joy and always a track of pain. So just embrace that. Oh, yeah, and that kind of set me free to realize that like, okay, it's, it's okay that things are going great in my life, but it's also okay that there's some parts that it just really aren't going great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so if, metaphors are powerful. Yeah. If Arthur Brooks and John Piper and Rick Warren agree on something, it has to be <laughs> settled <laughs> in heaven. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. So was there anything in the book that we haven't addressed that was really impactful to you guys? I feel like we've pretty much covered it. I, most of the illustrations that I've held on to um, have, I think we've talked about them. Yeah, it was nice to know you're, um, there's a whole type like you. Yeah, that, that's just, just affirming when you're like, okay, this is not, not unusual. You. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier, you know, quoting from the different, uh, what I said was annoying was I felt like sometimes he was leaning so hard into the Buddhist thing that I was like, yeah. all right, I got it. But um, but knowing that that the Bible actually gives us, I think, the best path through this, and it's actually affirming that even in other non-Christian religions. That pattern they sense the general revelation that we do, that God has built this into the arc of the human life. And as with all things, following Jesus and walking that path of disciple making disciples is going to lead you through this yeah. with joy, um, with so joy, joy in a way that, that um, after you read this book by Arthur Brooks, then go back and reread your, your epistles in your new Testament. And you might do it through a different lens. Mm. I want to say this about what left an impression on me was he talks about how he was a very accomplished French horn player. Mm. Yeah. And how many hours he devoted to trying to be something in French horn. And mm-hmm. and later in life, he realized that part of his chapter was over. He was onto something new. But he woke up every morning. And it was like an addiction. His body craved going back to playing French horn because it had, for years, that was the scorecard for him. That hit really close to me, home to me, JD, because like as being a president of a company now, every morning I wake up and I think, what am I going to preach this Sunday? Like it's just, it's so ingrained in me yeah. and I almost feel like I'm a loser if I'm not preparing a sermon, but I don't, I enjoy preaching as part of my job, but it's not like the main thing that I do anymore. And it's, I'm not playing the French horn anymore and be embracing that. Mm. Like God's called me to do something new now. That was a part of my life and a big part of my life for that season. So I think one of the reasons that pastors don't transition well is that they're terrified of putting something behind them that has given them so much approval like preaching mm. yeah. or some part of pastoral ministry. And so God's calling them, yeah. God's calling them to some new chapter, but they're terrified to try something new because they've gotten so much fulfillment out of all yeah. those texts that come in Sunday afternoon. That was a, a home run so today. True. So true. Um, so I think it's a good book to read and self assess, like how addicted am I to the trappings of ministry rather than the real Lord of the ministry is Jesus. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you. This has been such a fun conversation. We could do this all day, but we got to get down to other things. I know you do okay. too, but thanks for thanks for chiming in. The book is From Strength to Strength. Check it out. And when we post this episode, uh, we'll, we'll put some comments there for you guys to to listen in and, and grab for yourself as well. Thanks for being Good to see here. You. Hey, Good I'm challenging the two of y'all to a, a couple's Murph. Hey, CrossFit Murph at we, the SBC we, in, in, in listen, New Orleans. I listen. am not peer pressured. I will not be doing that, but I do work out. <laughs> Okay. I like I'm not better than working out. Either. Someone bought us a couple's massage we're getting Thursday. I like that. Ooh, I oh, like that's that. a great idea. We've yeah. never a done that before. couple's massage. That's a great plan. That's a good awesome. hobby. Yeah. I'll send you a selfie. Right. Bye, guys. <laughs> the Glass House is a production of Lifeway. It's produced and edited by Angie Elkins. Sound engineering by Dale Sandberg. Original music by Robert Elkins. Photography by Rebecca McVeigh. And artwork by Heather Berzinski. We are your hosts, Ben and Lindley Mandrell. Thanks for listening.